Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the fourth session of the 2023 Older Adults and Opioids webinar series hosted by the Finger Lakes Geriatric Education Center. We are a HRSA-funded geriatric workforce enhancement program at the University of Rochester, and our co-sponsor, the Western New York Rural Area Health Education Center, is also a HRSA HRSA funded education center. My name is Laura Robinson and I am the program coordinator for the FLGEC. My co-host is Christine Chappell. She is the administrative coordinator at the Western New York Rural Air. AHEC. We are so glad you could join us for our third year of hosting this series. We have just one housekeeping issue for, or not issue, but item for you. Please use the chat button to type hello and introduce yourself with a name, a job title, an agency, a location, whatever you'd like to share with us would be great. We have people from across the country and the world joining us today. We welcome people from all across New York State. Our speaker is from Massachusetts, and we have viewers who have registered from North Dakota, Tennessee, Oklahoma, California, California, Indiana, and South Africa. So thank you so much for joining us today. So again, please introduce yourself, especially if your Zoom name does not match your real name. That helps us out a lot with attendance, and I can only provide CME and social work credits to real people with real names. Thank you. So now I'm going to go through our disclosure slides. So here are our learning objectives for today. We have no um, disclosures to proclaim for the speakers or the planning committee. Claiming your credit will happen after the webinar. I, am, I will be taking attendance. The attendance needs to be sent over to our CEL office. They ask for 30 days to upload the attendance. It usually doesn't take that long. Credits will not be uploaded by April 8th because that is a typo. That is from last month or the month before. So I apologize for that. So let's try June 8th <laughs> for your credits to be in the system. If you don't see them by then, definitely please email me. And there was no commercial funding received to support this activity. So now I will stop sharing my slides and invite our speaker to please share her slides while I introduce her. And today, our featured speaker is Dr. Oliveira Boganovic, and Dr. Boganovic is the Medical Director of Ambulatory Services in the Division of Alcohol, Drugs, and Addiction at McLean Hospital, the largest psychiatric teaching hospital affiliated with Harvard Medical School. She divides her time between clinical and administrative and teaching activities, which includes teaching medical students and residents, as well as addiction and geriatric fellows. Dr. Boganovich's scholarly work and primary area of clinical innovation is in two major areas of investigation. The first is developing effective treatments for benzodiazepine use disorders, and then also developing innovative treatments for elderly patients with substance use disorders. So now I am happy to turn our program over to Dr. Boganovich, and we can see your slides. They're just not in presentation mode. So hello. Thank you Hi. for the introduction. Is, are we okay with the slides or do I need to do something differently? If you could put them in present, not in, in presentation mode, because we can see all the slides down the left side of the screen. So up in the toolbar, there is something that says slideshow. So if you go home, oh, yes. design, Let me just... yep. Is it okay now? That is perfect. Thank you so much. So I know that the title of the slide says opiate use disorder in adult, older adults. We will be talking about women and opiate use disorder, especially we'll be talking about that they're the majority of the Patients that present for treatment are women who struggle with opiate use disorder and chronic pain. Uh, mostly what we see with the men is patients who are have com more comorbidity of other substance use disorders, and they present as well with the opiate use disorder. Uh, I have no disclosures, um, so we can start with a case that involved an 80-year-old widowed female who was on long-term opiate therapy for severe pain due to shoulder osteoarthritis. She had a comorbid condition of a diabetes mellitus, uh, and her current med medication regimen included morphine every eight hours, as well as tramadol, uh, 100 milligrams every six hours. Uh, 
She has been on that medication regimen for a number of years. And more recently, uh, she reported depression to her primary care physician, as well as escalating pain use, which resulted in uh, prescribing both medications over the past several months. And this is a case that was a number of years ago before we were alerted to the opiate crisis. And again, when the opiate crisis happened, uh, it mostly, we talked about the younger population and unfortunately with the younger population, it was associated with multiple overdoses. And uh, somehow in this process, we tend not to think that older patients can actually also struggle as well, and it can be deadly for them as well. Uh, just a little bit to talk about the opiate crisis in the United States. Uh, it's the deadliest drug crisis in the US history. We have seen over a half a million overdose deaths from the period of time of 1999 to 2018. And even during the pandemic, uh, unfortunately, uh, the opiate overdose crisis continued and it continued especially with the fentanyl use. Um, it's really something you know, to look at that every day, 128 people die from an opiate overdose. And as I said, it has been accelerating during the COVID pandemic. Um, and what we have seen more with the COVID pandemic, we have seen more the fentanyl, uh, and the fentanyl remains problematic. Uh, there are some new opiates every day introduced and the struggles continue with the opiate use. Um, again, this is just something to kind of see it more in the slide presentation and the increased use of opiates. Um, another thing to also look at that a lot of the opiate use results unfortunately with the opiate use disorder. And um, very, very quickly, uh, this is a medication that even with the two weeks, patients can become physiologically dependent. And that's a big problem. So within the two weeks, patients become physiologically dependent and very quickly they can develop an opiate use disorder. Um, still even nowadays, uh, 21 to 30% of patients are continuously prescribed opiates for chronic pain. And those that are, uh, the, the, the ones that are prescribed continue to misuse them. What is specifically interesting, and especially also for women, uh, the patients who are prescribed opiates, uh, they notice an, um, that there's an improvement in the depression. And sometimes because of that, they misuse them. Again, somewhere between 8 to 12% develop a serious opiate use disorder. The percentage of that is much lower in the geriatric population, but it's still significant, and it's still significant because of the adverse effects of opiates in the geriatric uh, 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 population. Um, this is uh, an estimated 4 to 6% who are prescribed opiates transition to heroin, we see that a little bit uh, less in the older population and about 80% of people who use heroin first misused prescription opiates. Um, opiate misuse, the definition is uh, that uh, they're using it without a prescription of one's own, or if they do have a prescription, they tend to misuse that prescription. Uh, and anyway, that misuse of opiates is not directed by any of the prescribers. Um, some of the features of the opiate use disorder is the use of opiates in increased amounts or longer than intended, persistent wish or unsuccessful effort to cut down or control opiate use. Uh, with the opiate use disorders, the cravings are very strong. Um, and uh, um, what we see mostly in the younger population that they continue using opiates with and that affects their important obligations. With the elderly people, we don't use, we don't see that uh, because most of them are uh, retired. They don't have job uh, performances that they have to run to. And basically they live alone. So sometimes 
that opiate use disorder is really not recognized in the uh, within the older population. Um, and we uh, do see very often with the opiate use disorder the withdrawal uh, sy symptoms. It is important and um, that to do screening tools for any substance use disorder, it is important to do screening tools for substance use disorders in the geriatric population as well. We tend not to think that they can suffer from a substance use disorder, but they do. So screening is important. Uh, monitor the prescription drug monitoring program is important. And if somebody, there are some other scales that can be used like a CIS scale. And it's also very important to assess how much people have an opiate use disorder and to uh, somewhat kind of see, is it an opiate use disorder or if it's only a physiological dependence. Uh, again, what I said previously, most of the public outreach and research and media are focusing on the younger uh, individuals, but opiate use disorder does affect older adults. Um, what we have seen in the older population is we see an increased risk related to hospitalizations and uh, increased visits in the emergency department. What is very interesting in the emergency department when older individuals present, people don't think about their presentation uh, of, of opiate withdrawal, and we tend to think uh, that something else is going on. Again, 80% of the older adults struggle with uh, some form of osteoarthritis, so managing the chronic pain is very important. Um, and uh, again, older adults, um, particularly we see more prescription given to women struggle with chronic pain and there is some misuse. Again, if we do have a triangle of a person who does have chronic pain and a mood disorder as well, uh, we tend to see the misuse in, in that population more. Um, they can, uh, opiate misuse can progress as well to an opiate use disorder. And again, we have to be very cognizant also of any adverse effects of opiates. So what are the risk factors? It's the chronic pain. Again, the most common uh, chronic pain condition is osteoarthritis, but there are other pain conditions. And uh, as we get older, some patients do have cancer. Uh, chronic medical conditions are a risk factor. Again, a past history of opiate use disorder is a risk factor for uh, re-emergence of, uh, uh, of, uh, of the relapse. Um, we will talk a little bit about the importance of assessing for comorbid conditions, and especially as I said, that some of the opiate medications tend to improve the depression and um, as well as uh, even the medication assisted treatment that includes buprenorphine and methadone, it does sometimes also uh, help with uh, the mood symptoms. Unfortunately, that tends to then lead to an opiate use disorder. Uh, history of adverse childhood experiences or uh, history of severe trauma is a risk factor as well. And again, like something that is more common among males is pre predominantly males is a family history of substance use disorder. Um, again, you know, with aging, we tend to deal with a lot of success uh, social factors. And I tend to always talk to the patients of the importance of successful aging. And successful aging is really kind of planning your aging and planning some form of fulfillment it's a protective factor so that when you know loss appears, which is always going to appear, how can we protect ourselves and go on? And retirement brings you know some risk factors. So people who are uh, who mostly struggle are people with low of low socioeconomic status, low income, and low education as well. Um, we tend to see opiates need to be prescribed uh, following the surgeries, and it is very important nowadays still to treat the pain. So successful treatment of acute pain 
for a period of time uh, decreases the likelihood of use of the opiates. So opiates do continue to have a role following surgery, but again, it has it should be a very short prescription in addressing the pain. Um, sometimes there we tend to see long-term opiate use following those surgeries. Um, studies more in male have shown uh, that tobacco use was associated with increased risk for long-term opiate use. Uh, benzodiazepines were uh, also associated with long-term opiate use, but we tend to see them more with women. And I'm talking about prescriptions, prescri uh, benzodiazepines prescribed by uh, physicians. Um, so we have some data that is a little bit older and the data is at least getting much better uh, for uh, the prescription of opiates. So, but this uh, somewhere between 2007 and 2012, uh, opiates were prescribed, 8% of them were prescribed for patients who were uh, older than 60 compared to the younger population. And uh, the, as we talked about, there are reasons why. Um, and data from the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey showed that uh, patients that are older than 65, that 25% were long-term users. Um, and most of them, as I said, 49% uh, use prescription for pain relief. Um, and uh, we see that during the period of time when unfortunately the opiates came and we did not know about the addiction potential, there was a huge surge of opiate prescriptions. Um, again, older adults are likely to be imposed, exposed to, uh, because of different practices, uh, higher doses of opiates. We do see as, again, a co-prescription with benzodiazepines. Um, and we see continuous opiate therapy with pain diagnosis more in the older population. Uh, Again, non-medical prescription drug use doubled uh, in that period of time uh, of 2002 to 2014. And uh, in 2014, 13, 2.2% uh, did report non-medical use of prescription opiates within the past, uh, 12, past 12 months and 5% did during their lifetimes. And it's, you know, also happens in the older adults sometimes uh, that there is some uh, prescription sharing. Uh, so that's why we were seeing more of that. The portion of older adults using heroin also doubled, but the numbers are still very, very low. And the reason why it doubled, because it has been uh, much cheaper. Um, uh, and again, the Medicare beneficiaries, just because also of the age and disabilities, uh, have been among the fastest growing rates of patients diagnosed with opiate use disorder. Um, just focusing again on women, uh, they're more likely to have chronic pain and be prescribed uh, prescription pain. And it, it's usually women are prescribed higher dosages compared to uh, men. Um, and that's from the CDC. Uh, the prescription pain relief overdoses among women also increased from to, uh, 1999 to 2010 compared to uh, men. Um, and uh, uh, mostly with, unfortunately, with the suicide victims, what has been found is that uh, they were among women, mostly what we see uh, in the urine screens are opiates and benzodiazepines that have been prescribed. Um, heroin overdoses death also among women have tripled. Um, again, what we have to be very, very careful among older adults um, is when we do prescribe uh, CNS depressant medication, uh, we see an increased risk of falls as well as fractures and mostly hip fractures that we see in the older adults. And uh, falls have been re related to an increased mortality uh, among older adults. Uh, among the older population. Again, um, any medication that is given to an older adult the, because of different pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics, even the lower doses can um, affect uh, uh, the effects of uh, 
opiate medication. And obviously there's because of multiple drug-drug interactions, there can be alterations in the me metabolism. Um, again, what we mostly see uh, risk factors are among patients, older patients have multiple medical disorders. So uh, that we see some changes in the liver and the renal metabolism. Um, sometimes we see uh, polypharmacy, uh, but all of this results in an in, in impaired cognitive impairment, um, compromise breathing, and especially older women that struggle with osteoporosis, uh, the falls result uh, in fractures of the hip and spine. Um, again, just to refocus again, patients have multiple medical conditions and they have other health conditions that do predispose them to persistent pain, and they are more vulnerable also of developing persistent pain. So that's why I think it's very important to treat pain, uh, but not over-treat pain as well. Um, again, other medications that we would give to younger populations, sometimes we have to worry about the side effects of the non-steroidal uh, uh, anti-inflammatory medications, such as uh, in the family of ibuprofen. So because of most older adults have impaired renal functions, they have cardiac risk factors, they're on anticoagulation medications for AFib. Um, and so therefore, sometimes physicians can a more Re rely on opiate medications. Again, uh, we, we were over treating the pain when uh, the medications initially were advertised, but again, the under treatment of pain has its own risks. And sometimes patients who are not prescribed pain medication tend to kind of result and get medications from other sources. So we should really be um, cautious about that. Um, again, because as we all get older, our, everything changes in the body and we are at increase, increased risk for any adverse events. As in any medication in the elder, older adults, we have to make sure that the medication is uh, adjusted to the age. Uh, our body changes, our kidneys change. Um, and as well that medications just get sl much uh, uh, slowly, much more slowly cleared from our system because of the decrease in total body water and uh, as well as increase in body fat. Um, and just in general, there's even in the brain a number of changes in the neurotransmitters, such as the dopamine, serotonin, and glutamine. Um, I think the very important piece is, again, when assessing uh, somebody older, especially uh, there is an increased prevalence of depression and anxiety among older women. So it's very important to do a full assessment of somebody who presents. Um, again, the research is coming, there's more and more research coming out, but it's still very limited. But there is a high correlation between substance use disorders, alcohol use, depression, and other affective disorders. And 11.1% have more uh, have a co-occurring alcohol or illicit drug disorder, as well as there's a 32% of uh, on the other way around. So anybody who does present with uh, a substance use disorder should be assessed as well for any uh, psychiatric condition and vice versa. Um, Older adults and suicide. Uh, older adults have a higher suicide rate than the population than the general population, and uh, older adult suicide completers are less likely to have attempted suicide previously and more likely to be successful completers. Uh, Seventy-two point nine percent of elderly suicide involved firearms. That is mostly male. However, what we see in older women, we see more the presence of uh, an overdose with opiates and, uh, and benzodiazepines. Um, as I said, uh, and, 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 and that's sometimes it's questionable, do they use those two substances kind of just to help, uh, help the pro unfortunate process of completing the suicide? But 
um, I think it's very important to see that there is a correlation and that we should think that there is alcohol, but predominantly also opiates and benzodiazepines. And that's what we see more uh, with uh, older women. So what can we do as prescribers, and especially when somebody is presenting uh, with the risks of opiate use is really do a careful assessment of what is going on with the person, uh, what is, do a full, very careful psychiatric assessment, focusing not only on the opiate, on the opiate use, but focusing also on the medical conditions, how much the medical conditions are affecting their functioning, uh, and why? Uh, what is going on with the pain? And uh, you really using a multidisciplinary approach of treatment of pain is extremely important in this population. So uh, just following on, on not only the medication aspect of treating pain, but other forms of treatment of pain, which is uh, forms of acupuncture, uh, acupuncture, acupressure, uh, seeing what other physical therapy. Um, and if, unfortunately, uh, is that's the only solution of treatment of pain, be very vigilant about what medications we use for pain. Um, and again, as I said, it's a very important multidisciplinary approach to treatment of uh, opiate use disorders where uh, all uh, the specialties have an, a, a significant and very important role on assessing it. There are unfortunately many barriers for still treatment of substance use disorder in the older population. Um, and we see that one of the recent studies showed that the 10% of, of total S, uh, substance use disorder admission is all, all uh, older adults, we don't think about uh, referring them to medication-assisted treatment. Uh, we do have medication-assisted treatment for the treatment of pain that include uh, uh, three medications, and we'll talk a little bit more uh, about those medications. Uh, it's, uh, it's buprenorphine or Suboxone and that has also pain-treating properties. Patients can be referred to, uh, for treat, treatment with methadone. And uh, the naltrexone is a little bit trickier to use in the older population just because of their chronic pain issues and perhaps needing some uh, hospital admissions where pain uh, needs to be taken into consideration. Um, nursing homes still tend to be very leery about taking patients who are on medication-assisted treatment. So uh, there were multiple studies shown that uh, in Ohio, a group of presenting over uh, 900 of their care facilities still were leery about take, accepting patients uh, uh, that are on methadone or buprenorphine. Uh, there are still even in the Massachusetts area where we are tending to really try to push medication assisted treatment. We still struggle with finding uh, uh, facilities that do accept medication assisted treatment. And I mean, it is the American Disability Act is consider, considers that opiate use disorder is a recognized uh, uh, disability, but still there are struggles on of taking patients um, for treatment. Um, again, uh, what is very uh, important in recognizing that if somebody does have a substance use treatment is to try to tailor the treatment for uh, to the adults. Um, and when we were running our uh, residential and um, partial program, unfortunately, we close our partial program. Uh, a lot of patients who were older, especially kind of in the 70 to 80 years range, um, they uh, were struggling when they were in the program with the younger adults that had their own um, issues. So I think that tailoring the program to older adults is very important. Uh, currently, there are um, 53 uh, three substance use services facilities in 26 states that are dedicated specifically to the older adults. Um, despite uh, the availability 
uh, that there is specifically tailored program, we still tend to see in the facilities more male, widowed or divorced, retired white people. So uh, women tend to still kind of uh, more engage in outpatient treatment. Uh, what is specific for uh, the older adults is that, as I said, we the specific things, and especially uh, we see more just because women live longer, uh, they are widows. That is a risk factor. Uh, there is also a percentage of people operating while intoxicating, but uh, it's as we see, the numbers are much lower, and that was more uh, for alcohol. Older adults have significantly more hospitalizations just because of the adverse effects of the substance use. Um, and uh, as I said, one the, the best part, I think, of treating it adult, older adults is that, that really reflects also for both substance use disorder that and and even and patients also who have a comorbid disorder that if they engage in treatment uh, they are successful in completing the treatment. Um, most of the referrals are coming through the healthcare settings. Um, sometimes you know family does recognize this, but the families need a lot of education about substance use disorder. Again, the good news is that most of the studies have shown, um, especially in the range of the younger range, that if they engage in treatment, they will uh, complete the treatment. Uh, and what most of the patients find very, I do run a, uh, one group for substance use disorder on an outpatient basis for substance use disorder in older population, and it is mostly uh, a female group is that what they really find very helpful is the ability that they can disclose problems that are related to their age because uh, there are a lot of problems with the widowhood, the losses, not only of the losses of the spouse, but the loss of friendships, the distance of the families, the families involved more in their own lives, as well as the cognitive and the physical decline has been associated with that. Um, what is very important when we do have and how to engage somebody in treatment is uh, engaging in a non-confrontational treatment approach, because uh, even though we, and it's very, it's the predominantly a lot of the times, especially in the group that I have been running, uh, most patients are still dealing with the shame. This is an older generation and the shame is very difficult for them to overcome. So uh, focusing on a non-confrontational approach is very, very important. Um, again, building their self-worth, especially the self-esteem is important, I think. Women tend to uh, focus on the grandkids, but the grand the window of opportunity to be their hero is only 10 years. So once they're grown up, they still need to kind of really think and focus about how to build their social network. Um, teaching them the coping skills. Again, the comorbidity is very, very high. And uh, with the older population, especially with the women, we see an increase in the depression and anxiety. So giving them tools, uh, whether it's, you know, cognitive behavioral tools, supportive psychotherapy is very important for them. Um, and the one thing that is very important, it's not easy to deal, I think, with the two different spectrums. It's not easy to deal with the teenagers, uh, but it's also not easy to deal with the older adults. Uh, so I think a dedicated staff is very, very important. And I think what really comes uh, comes into play is the case management services, because a lot of them need a lot of help dealing with their multiple medical conditions, making sure that the appointments are coordinated um, is, is a very important piece of a multidisciplinary approach. Um, any therapy can work for patients with both substance use disorder and uh, comorbid condition. I think the first step is the motivational interviewing 
therapy where we will meet the patients where they are uh, and then try to engage them in treatment. Um, they do well in a group setting, especially if it's tailored uh, to their age. Uh, they also do well in individual treatment. Um, and again, involving the family, whether if there is a living spouse, but also the children and involving them and helping the children understand their struggles is very important. So uh, again, it's a multidisciplinary approach that involves integrating the substance use in the treatment, the mental health, but also helping them uh, coordinate their uh, appoint medical uh, appointments is also important. There are uh, very few bases that offer services in home, and especially for some older people, that is a very important thing. I think what we have found out that uh, with the use of technology, they can engage in telehealth, uh, but uh, most of the people, especially the older people, even during the acute phase of uh, COVID, I, I, they wanted to come to the office. They were willing to take the risk. And again, you know, having a long-term approach that once the problems are identified, that they know that they can, uh, that if there's no limitation to the uh, how long they stay in treatment is also very important. Again, uh, there's an, uh, they have multiple medical problems. They have mobility problems, though there were, therefore offering home-based treatment is very important. And even uh, with the onset of the cognitive problems is continuing to engage them in treatment. Again, uh, where I say that it's very important to involve staff that is interested in treating adults is focusing and understanding their sensory deficits. Um, and also understanding that even if we do need to get them in treatment, uh, that uh, it's very important to get them the detoxification piece, admit them to a facility, but knowing that it's not going to be a four day detox, but that the detoxification can take a long time and having them st stay in treatment. Um, some medical things that is important to know about uh, opiate withdrawal. Opiate withdrawal in any age group is very, very uncomfortable, uh, but it does not lead to severe, uh, serious medical complications. It does not lead to um, delirium. And in this process, what is very important is to use medication assisted treatment. Again, what we have to remember is that we still, even if they have an opiate use disorder, uh, we can detoxify them. But what is very important is we need to continue to engage them in treatment. And partly engaging them in treatment meaning, means treating their pain, and the two medications for the treatment of pain are the buprenorphine that has been very successful in older adults as well as methadone. Um, what is uh, what we see with buprenorphine that it's the lower, re, lower there's no patients maintained on buprenorphine have a lower risk of creating euphoria. There's a lower, there's a lesser risk of overdoses and death. It's available in different forms. So it can be available in the tablet form, film form, and we are now having long-term uh, injectable medications that ha can be prescribed for patients. Again, for pain management, it's best that we prescribe them in divided dosages during the day. Um, methadone is another medication that is uh, uh, can be used for the treatment of adults, but we have to uh, make sure to assess their kidneys, how their kidneys are functioning. There are increased risk of QTC prolongation. So it's also important to follow up on that. And as we know, a lot of older populations do struggle with constipation and they are very particular in um, having the constipation addressed. So uh, uh, constipation can be pretty serious with methadone. Um, there have been studies that have shown on different levels uh, about addressing the opiate use disorder in uh, 
uh, in older adults and the interventions have aimed about educating and rehabilitation. I think a lot is about education. So there could be all hospital systems have an opiate use uh, um, uh, initiative and specifically focusing on monitoring the opiate prescriptions for the physicians and the physicians checking who is prescribing and offering different forms of treatment, especially for the elderly, we more focus on the use of uh, Tylenol. Um, and again, uh, a lot of studies have assessed reducing the opiates in the context of maintaining important uh, the pain control, which is a very important thing. Um, they have been also focusing on us, uh, of training the patients. So there has been particularly one program that uh, was a three week program uh, that really uh, that incorporated cognitive behavioral model and different a holistic approach for the treatment of pain that included physical therapy, occupational therapy, biofeedback and relaxation and wellness instruction. And the goal was to um, to to uh, the discontinuation of opiates and treatment with Tylenol. Uh, the study involved, that particular study involved around 78 people over age 60. And as we see, there was a large reduction in, de in depression. Again, most of the patients had a comorbid psychiatric condition. Um, and as we think, you know, somebody who has a chronic pain depression, we tend to catastrophe, they tend to catastrophize. So once using all those techniques, that is a holistic approach of treatment of all three conditions resulted in increased psychosocial and social functioning as well. Um, again, the number of adults receiving methadone is also growing. Uh, before there were percentages less than 1%, somewhere we're talking now about uh, two percent, and uh, basically, as 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 shown in all other uh, studies, older adults did better uh, for research purposes. Uh, older adults are defined as fifty five and older, um, and uh, they were more likely to have longer duration of absence, especially we see it for women. And women uh, aged 55 to 77 remained in treatment longer than men. So as I said, uh, mostly we see men in, uh, in detox settings and uh, uh, residential settings. Women tend to still start with outpatient treatment and engaging them is very important. Um, so going back to this case, this is a patient who was switched to buprenorphine in divided dosages and she remained stable and engaged in treatment. So just to summarize what we talked about uh, uh, older adults, we have to think uh, about the older adults and although it's difficult to quantify because it's still research has not focused, it has been a growing problem. Um, there are increased risks for consequences of substance, even of substance misuse, just because of the medical condition, especially the changes in the liver condition, the changes in the uh, body fat and water and coexisting medical conditions. Um, even uh, nowadays, the, 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 there is a big push of diagnosing it in older populations. It's still underdiagnosed. Um, Alcohol, by any ways, is the biggest culprit, but I think benzodiazepines and opiates are there, and uh, cannabis is on the rise. And addressing the treatment, focusing on the issues that older adults, older women have, shows uh, that they can be if the treatment approach can be very successful. Uh, what is very important is to focus on a multidisciplinary team approach and a holistic approach of treating not only the substance use disorder, but treating the medical conditions and the psychiatric conditions as well. So with this, I will end the presentation and I'm open to any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Boganovic. That was wonderful. That was a lot of information. I know I have a question, but I've also seen a couple in the chat. So I'm going to read those. 
to you. I have to scroll. Hang on. Okay. So it says, are you familiar with the with how reimbursement from Medicare or Medicaid is for MAT, the medication assisted treatment for older adults? Is there as much denials as there are with the younger population and insurance coverage? So uh, from what I is, uh, you know, I'm not 100 percent, uh, you know, in, previewed into it, but I am previewed as an administrator. And the reimbursement for medication assisted treatment among the older adults has been very good, less denial, uh, and uh, been more flexible with compared to younger adults. Laura, you're muted. Thanks so much. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Next question is, are there any inpatient programs for long-term nursing home patients who were admitted to the facility with the addiction, which has been sustained with opioids for pain management while admitted? Unfortunately, there are no programs, as was I pointed out in the other slides, even still in the Boston area, we're still struggling with that and struggling to get patients in treatment in facilities and vice versa, like once they're stabilized and just even getting them into residential programs, you know, it's still, there's a, a lot of demand for treatment, substance use treatment, and they tend to be kind of more pushed in the geriatric inpatient units, which is not the most appropriate place for them. And then from there, placing them can be a difficult task as well. Thank you. So please, if, if, if folks have other questions, please add them to the chat. I know I had one for you. One of your slides mentioned that opioid withdrawal does not lead to delirium. And I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about that because we're, um, a lot of our hospitalists are, are focused on the three Ds, dementia, delirium, and depression. And so I think it would be quite easy to maybe mistake opioid withdrawal for delirium. So are there studies or- yeah, so that's the one thing that we kind of uh, is very important to focus and even especially mm -hmm. the emergency department settings is recognizing symptoms of opiate withdrawal. Uh, symptoms of opiate withdrawal are very, uh, are very uncomfortable. There's a lot of restlessness, diarrhea, intolerance to the physical temperature, to, uh, goosebumps. It's not a medic. It's not medically dangerous, but what happens is people mis have mistaken that for a delirium, mm -hmm. for different delirium, possibly even due to a medical condition, and do not recognize and address that as part of it. I think most of us in the training, especially as, as uh, physicians, we more tend to think not to miss the delirium tremens. But it's also important to recognize the physical symptoms of opiate withdrawal. You don't die, but it's you are very, very sick. Thank you. That's that's very helpful and goes along with our next question from the chat. Are there any resources for families to assist them in identifying this? Uh, just giving them information of what 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 the opiate withdrawal symptoms are. Um, I think SAMHSA has some pamphlets for the treatment of opiate uh, of treatment of substance use disorder. So just introducing and educating the family, uh, educating the family that uh, chronic pain conditions can lead to uh, opiate long term opiate use and then possibly misuse and opiate use disorder. So it's really very important for the family members to understand what has led to the condition. I think what we mostly see at the struggles that older adults are dealing with is the shame and guilt uh, that is associated with, uh, with having a substance use disorder. And that, has, uh, that really creates a tension with the family as well. I think that you know, no, if you don't have that education, about the increased prevalence of both psychiatric conditions as well as substance use disorders, we tend to sometimes think, oh, it's only the aging, it's also only that they lost their purpose, which is part of the problem. This is what I was talking about, the importance of successful aging 
and finding a purpose, but that's also, again, a multidisciplinary approach. And so the families tend to think, oh, it's just kind of the old age, they lost their purpose, this is their, their presentations, they're just kind of anxious and agitated. That is not the case. Right. There was a second comment on based on that question was it's how do we get families involved right from the start because that's difficult. Uh, there's privacy issues, there's autonomy issues. So any it's it's really what I talked about the non confrontational approach with the elderly and meeting them where they are and talking about the fact and I'm not sure uh, the big factor I for, that I may have not uh, put in the slides is the loneliness. And just talking about the loneliness, talking about who is there of the family members, how the family member can be helpful with keeping in mind that, you know, it's not going to be taking away their guardianship and somebody's going to take over. So letting them know that there is autonomy, but that it's so important to involve family. And, 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 and that's even the first step, you know, because if they do think it's a substance use disorder, they tend to kind of withdraw the family especially they tend to withdraw the grandkids and that you know affects somebody because that's that's what they're looking for uh we we really tend to miss on that and you just kind of making that balance and giving them that carrot that if they get better and if they involve the family they will be able to see their grandkids and that the grandkids will appreciate them it's that carrot that everybody needs exactly Okay, I don't see any more questions. Last chance. This was a wonderful session. We truly appreciate your time. I am going to wrap up a little early. Everybody does never minds getting a few minutes of their day back. So thank you everyone for joining us today. Dr. Boganovic's slides will be sent out to you this afternoon. I will send you an email with a link to an evaluation survey that I also put in the chat. We do value your thoughts. So please take two minutes or even less to provide feedback on this session and any ideas you have for future sessions. And we also hope to see you next month for our very last session for this year. That will be on Thursday, June 15th. For Charlotte Crawford, she is a fan favorite talking about opioid overdose prevention and doing Narcan training. You will get a free Narcan kit mailed to you after the session. So thank you, everyone, and we hope you have a wonderful day, and we'll see you next month. And thank you again, Dr. Boganovic. You're welcome. Bye now.